Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about car care, keeping your car up and down the road so it doesn't leave you on the side of the road like the buggy did a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't anything to do with maintenance. It was something to do with that old feature in the vehicle that no longer worked and was overriding the ignition. So the reason you want to maintain your vehicle, do the things that need to be done when they need to be done is so that you don't end up on the side of the road. It's that old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, which means sometimes it's easier to keep the front end grease than it is to replace parts of the front end later on down the road. And that's essentially what's going to happen if you don't keep your vehicle maintained well. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. My friend Goose is here from Sudbury, Ontario, Bricks for Wheels, uh, that's Corey. Corey is the moderator, he does an excellent job of keeping out the bad people and getting up the videos that I suggest you have a look at for further details. My friend Tim is here from Nanoose Bay on Vancouver Island, uh, which is just north of Nanaimo. Buify is here from Mission BC. Z is tuning in from New York. Evan is here. And my friend Mallory is tuning in from the Maritime. So if you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know uh, what questions you might have about passing a driver's test, becoming a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you out with all of that. Carl is here from Ottawa. My friend Joe is tuning in from Toronto, and uh, thank you, Joe, for sending me that information last week on bilateral something, it was called. Essentially what it's called is keeping space around your vehicle, and if you can keep space around your vehicle, you can reduce congestion. And I would like to thank all of the people that left comments on the TikTok videos, because this is where that came from, is, uh, you know, I was talking about that, leaving space in your ve in front of your vehicle so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the pavement, which is approximately one vehicle length, and as well maintaining that three to five second following distance. And of course, nobody measures the three to five second following distance. Essentially, they just kind of guess it. But essentially what you need to do, if you are using the brake for anything other than downhill speed control, coming to a stop, slowing for cars in front, or unexpected events, you're probably following too close because you should be using the gas pedal, the accelerator, for controlling speed, or controlling space rather, in front of your vehicle. If you're using the brake for that, you're too close and you're being reactionary. So as Joe just reminded me, it's called bilateral control, which is essentially managing space around your vehicle. And if we can all manage space around our vehicle, oddly enough, we could reduce congestions in our urban areas and other places on interstates and freeways and whatnot. So all excellent. And what I was going to say, Joe, is uh, in a few weeks here, I am going to do a full presentation on bilateral control once I work through some of those sources and some of those uh, media articles and whatnot. So thank you for sending that to me. Uh, Tyler, my car's check engine light was on because the battery voltage was low did start my car for a week. And yes, Tyler, we're gonna talk about the battery here a little bit in terms of maintenance and whatnot, but the battery won't just stop working one day. It will in the winter time if it's cold or you have extreme heat or those types of things, but most of the time uh, so other things will stop working that rely on the battery. As you were saying, the check engine light comes on to indicate that something's wrong with the car. They plug it in, they read the codes, and they will tell you what is wrong with your vehicle. Uh, a few years ago when the exhaust went on my vehicle and the catalytic, the catalytic converter was acting up, the codes said that there was something wrong with the catalytic converter. So know that and we'll talk about the battery as well. My friend Doug is here. How are you, my friend? Awesome, awesome. And John uh, Lenoy is tuning in from the Philippines. Hello, Trey is here from Regina, Saskatchewan. Hello, everyone. So. Tonight we're talking about car care, maintenance on your vehicles, things that need to be done periodically, some more often than others, and what you need to check, what you can look at, a little bit of troubleshooting. I'm by no means a technician, but I am a little bit older, own cars, uh, know some of these things. It's going to vary a little bit from vehicle to vehicle. You can talk to the dealership. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, forums on site uh, that you can look at in terms of different things for different cars. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, Mallory, I said, if you're driving on, uh, at night on a long road, make sure that all your lights are working on your vehicle. And yes, that is another thing I'm going to talk about once a month, approximately, as Mallory just said. Uh, you should be checking the lights on your vehicle, making sure that they're all working and whatnot. Uh, Tyler says, unplug my battery, replugged it in, and it went away, didn't come back. Okay. Uh, you may get away with that for a spell, Tyler, but there, it, the check engine light may come back on and eventually you'll have to replace the battery on your vehicle. Uh, Goose says, my company wants me to change the oil every 16,000 kilometers. It's a 2020 Toyota Corolla. My thinking is that's pushing it big time, but I don't make the rules. Uh, seems okay so far. Uh, Goose, are you running synthetic oil in that uh, uh, Corolla that you have there? Because if you're running synthetic oil it will run your oil changes out farther. 16,000 kilometers seems a little much for an oil change on a car. I might push it to 12,000 kilometers if I'm running full synthetic oil on a vehicle, especially if you're running city driving, that's a bit harder on it, so you probably wanna change the oil a bit earlier. Uh, yeah, and Boston says, if you, and it's, like I said, if you have a newer vehicle and you're running full synthetic in it, then yes, you can run your oil changes out a little bit farther. But, you know, if you're not running synthetic oil, for example, my old buggy, I don't run synthetic oil in it. I just run old regular oil in it. And uh, I change the oil in it every 5,000 kilometers, which is about 3,000 miles, which is what you want to be changing the oil at. But as you said, then you want to... Uh, be running that out a little bit more. So 5,000, 6,000 miles uh, with full synthetic oil on a vehicle. Doug, uh, Rick, if your tires are wearing the unusual, it could be a bigger problem. Yes, that's absolutely true. And uh, Doug, if your tires are wearing unusually, then you wanna take your vehicle in for a wheel alignment. There's probably something wrong with the, you know, something in the vehicle uh, that needs to be replaced. And, uh, you know, that's something that you're going to notice or the tire shop is going to notice when you're rotating your tires and you should be rotating your tires every two oil changes. Now, if you're changing your oil at 12,000, 16,000 kilometers, that's a little bit much. If you're changing the oil at those kinds of intervals, then you should be rotating your tires every oil change because you should be doing your tires every 6,000 miles, every 10,000 kilometers on your vehicle to keep them wearing evenly. Uh... Joe says, yeah, 16,000 clicks, that's a little bit much. Uh, Tyler, suspension problems could cause unusual wear. Yes, they could. Uh, tie rod ends, uh, linkage in the front end, bushings. I uh, had bushings go out on the back end of the buggy, which let the back end go loose. There's all kinds of reasons for irregular tire wear on your vehicle, and these are all part and parcel of having inspections. So without further ado, let's get over to the presentation, and we'll come back at the end, and I'll answer any questions you have about car care, passing a road test, all those types of things. So getting started here, uh, look after your ride and it's gonna look after you. You don't wanna end up on the side of the road in you know, 100 degree weather or when it's sub-zero temperatures and it's minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. You just want your car to keep running. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. The reason I became a licensed commercial driving instructor was a bid to get off the road. I was an over-the-road truck driver. I was gone all of the time. It's really tough to have relationships when you're on the road. And we're talking the days before cell phones and the internet. So you didn't have those forms of communication that you do now. In the 1990s, it was pay phones. You were sitting on a pay phone. Fortunately, in the truck stops, they did have pay phones that you could use. They were sitting at the table and you could so you could sit at the table and talk to your uh family and those types of things but it's a little bit better now but still it's a lonely life and it's a hard life and they own you so this was the reason i became a licensed commercial driving instructor uh went back to university in the early 2000s graduated from the university of melbourne with a doctorate in legal history in 2006 uh greyhound i drove for one of the greyhound bus lines uh in australia while i was going to university there and then in 2015 uh, once you know, life went a little bit dark there, had a divorce, lost my job at the truck driving school and uh, started the online business, the YouTube channel and the website and whatnot. And it's been wildly, wildly more successful than I could have imagined. We are just crazy, crazy busy here. And uh, as I said, we're starting a podcast. 
finishing up a book here. So lots going on here on the other side of the, uh, of the computer screen there. New video this week, CDL driver's jobs. I was talking about why some CDL drivers are not checking their air brakes as part of their daily pre-trip inspection. And this is one of the kind of dirty little secrets in the trucking industry is, is that in order to check your air brakes and check pushrod travel, you have to have wheel chocks in the vehicle because you have, have a way of the vehicle not rolling away so that you can release the parking brakes and get out and check pushrod stroke. Uh, and uh, nobody really says that. Uh, there aren't push rod, there aren't uh, wheel chocks in the in the on the truck anywhere that we can actually get out and check our push rod travel. And uh, one of the mechanics had asked me about that, so I did a video on a short video. All right. So first thing that we talked about, you need to do oil changes. Uh, if you're just have an old vehicle and you're running regular oil, it's going to be three to five thousand miles for an oil change. And you're going to be doing a tire rotation based on the three to five thousand miles every two oil changes. Now, if you're running full synthetic oil as we were talking about, then you probably want to be doing a tire rotation uh, every oil change. So if your oil changes are twelve thousand kilometers, then you want to be rotating the tires at the same time. The reason you want to be rotating the tires is because we have front wheel drive vehicles and the tires steer and they wear differently than they do on the back. So there's different ways that they rotate the tires. If they are directional tires, the front go on the back and the back go on the front. If they're not directional tires, then the front right goes on the back left, the front left goes on the back right, and then, how does that work? And then the two back ones go to the front, okay? Your tire shop is going to know that for you, or you can simply look it up uh, according to the manufacturer of your tires, whether they're Bridgestones, Michelins, uh, Firestones, or whatnot, on their website, and they will show you how to rotate your tires. Most of us are just going to go into a tire shop and let them do that for us. Okay, it's inexpensive. It's like less than twenty dollars to get your tires rotated. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different filters. Not a whole bunch, but about a half a dozen different filters in your vehicle. Engine air filter. This is the filter that filters the dirt out of the air before it's put into your engine and mixed with the gasoline. So you should be changing the engine air filter every eight to 15,000 kilometers. Uh, I have engine air filter there twice, which not engine air filter, sorry, that should be the fuel filter <laughs> is what I meant. The fuel filter should be changed every 10 to 15,000 kilometers. And the air filters, the fuel filter is going to depend a little bit where you're buying fuel and what kind of roads you're driving on. So if you're driving on gravel roads or you're driving on uh, dusty, dirty roads and those types of things, then you're going to be needing to change the engine air filter more often than you normally would. Okay, cabin filter. Most vehicles will have a cabin filter in them. The buggy, for example, has a cabin filter in it. And this is the air that you breathe inside the vehicle. So you want to be changing the cabin filter every couple of years. And yes, this picture of this filter here, I'm embarrassed to say, is the filter out of the buggy. <laughs> I kind of forgot about it. And after five years, I thought, oh, you know, one day I thought, oh, maybe I should change this. Uh, they're not exactly easy to change. They're a little bit of a nuisance. It probably takes you about half an hour, 45 minutes to get all the bolts undone to get the thing in there. But, um, you know, <laughs> this is really gross. So I leave it at that. Automatic transmissions should be, the filter should be changed and the fluids should be changed uh, every 50 to 80,000 uh, miles on your vehicle. So change those as well and know there's a filter in there. Uh, fluids, transmission fluid, differential fluid, so your rear ends and your radiator fluid. All of these are kind of in the 75,000 to 100,000 uh, mile uh, range. Uh, these are not exact numbers, but they are something that should be changed. I recently changed the, the differential fluid in the buggy as well. Manual transmissions also have fluid in them and need to be changed and should be changed every couple of years to uh, maintain the vehicle, have proper lubrication for the gears and those types of things. So know that as well. Belts, uh, brakes, and batteries. Uh, most some, not all, some vehicles will have timing belts. Timing belts should be changed approximately every 100,000 kilometers, or 100,000 miles rather. The reason that timing belts need to be changed 
is there's uh, motors that are interference motors and non-interference motors. I have an interference motor in my buggy. And what that means is, is that the piston goes down and the valves uh, insert into the piston chamber. So if the belt breaks and you haven't changed it, <laughs> what happens is the piston comes up and smashes into the bottom of the valve, which wrecks the top end of your motor and it's about a three or $4,000 fix. Whereas you can change the timing belt, the water pump and the tensioner on it for about $1,000. And you need to do that every four or five years or 100,000 miles to not cause your engine to have the whole top end of it blow up. So make sure that you're changing the timing belt on your vehicle. Brakes are gonna last you 50 to 75,000 miles depending on the use of the brakes. Again, this comes back to, are you towing trailers? Are you hauling loads? Are you braking hard? Do you have one of those heavy lead foots? I was uh, at home last summer with my brother. He pulled in a big Chevy Tahoe and the woman who owned it was towing a horse trailer and my brother took the brakes off the car and they were almost done after eight months and she wasn't she didn't have the brakes set up on the trailer correctly and so therefore was relying on the truck brakes and wore out the truck brakes okay we talked about earlier uh, about the uh, with Tyler the batteries that'll last you five to ten years uh, generally they're not going to go right away they're not just going to leave you on the side of the road but they will kind of you know dwindle in terms of their ability to start the, the engine and then after a while they're just going to wear out and they're going to stop uh, the belts you can see here on the front of this picture of this engine here that there's a belt for the air conditioning unit there's a belt for the alternator and there's another belt on here for the water pump these are the main belts on the front that need to be checked and inspected every now and again if you see any fraying or cracks or those types of things that need to be replaced and then here i don't know whether you can see this but there's also the timing belt here as well and that's what you'll need to be replacing in terms of the timing belt now if you have a high performance car and it has a supercharger in it you're going to need to change that uh, supercharger belt approximately 60,000 miles suspension and tires Again, this is something that's going to wear with your driving style or going to vary. <coughs> Excuse me. This is something that's going to vary depending on your driving style. If you're driving hard and you're cornering hard, you're going to wear your tires out, especially if you have low pros like on this Maserati here. So know that, okay? Suspension uh, depends on the make and model of your vehicle, whether it's a high-end sports car, those types of things, you may have to change your suspension earlier and put different shocks and springs and those types of things in it oh, I went the wrong way sorry my apologies there we go okay electrical uh, spark plugs should be changed every 12 to 15,000 miles and wires uh, rotors and caps probably these are probably 20 to 30,000 miles in terms of spark plug wires your rotor and your cap but this is all part of getting your vehicle tuned up and keeping it running well uh, this electrical part is the uh, what sends the electrical signal and sets off your spark plugs in your vehicle so you need to have a big spark to ignite the fuel inside the cylinder chamber so that you can have the best combustion and the best uh, use of the fuel if you don't have a big spark that ignites the fuel then what's going to happen is the fuel isn't going to burn efficiently inside the engine compartment and you're going to get poor fuel mileage as well you're going to create more pollution that's going to be run through the catalytic converter and those types of things and essentially what's going to happen is it's going to cost you a lot more money and fuel troubleshooting so after a certain amount of time once you start getting up that 75,000 100,000 kilometers you might want to think about putting some fuel injector cleaner in all modern vehicles have fuel injection uh, thermostats uh, if the vehicle is heating up or you're not getting heat out of it in the winter time the thermostats have a four to five year uh, life and there's a spring in it and what happens is because the spring just gets weak after a period of time and it either won't open or it won't close in the winter time uh, air conditioning your air conditioning may wear out or it mean simply needs to be charged after a period of time I you know I know that you can go to Canadian Tire and you go to Costco and you can buy these recharging kits for your air conditioning and you can do it yourself my suggestion to you is to take it into an, a shop and get them to do it with the air conditioning because they have a machine that they put onto your air conditioning system in your vehicle and 
they can tell whether there are any leaks in your system because if your air conditioning fluid is down, you want to know whether there's leaks in it or those types of things so that they can have it fixed. And I know that it's inexpensive to get the air conditioning uh, charged. I've taken it into shops before and it's only about $100, $120. Uh, I showed you the, <laughs> the picture of the uh, cabin filter in the buggy. Uh, last winter, I realized that the defrost wasn't working very well in the buggy. Well, once I changed the cabin filter, I figured out why the defrost wasn't working because it's that filter that the air was being pulled through for the defrost, so it wasn't working. Now, electrical, all cars have fuses in them, much like the fuse panel in your house that now they're all breakers, but in the old days, they used to have fuses you used to have to uh, screw out and then put back in and replace the fuse. Cars are the same. You have fuses in your car, so if your horn's not working, first stop is to check the fuses, okay? And there is a little map that will tell you which fuse is for which electrical component in your vehicle, whether it's for the power mirrors or it's for the horn or for the headlights or those types of things. So first port of call, if you have something electrical that's not working in your vehicle, check the fuses. Most of the time the fuse panel will be down somewhere underneath the steering wheel compartment. If it's not down there, then check under the hood. There's another one under the hood as well and make sure that none of those are blowing. Now, if the fuses are blowing and you change it and it blows again, then you've got something wrong with your vehicle that's electrical and you'll need to take it into an auto mechanic and get it looked at. Now, we have a specialty electrical mechanic here in Vernon and if you have one of those and you have an electrical problem with your vehicle, then I suggest you take it to them uh, for that issue. Lights and tire inspection, okay, so once, once a month, you know, every couple of weeks, you should be checking the oil level on your vehicle. Uh, some will have a dipstick, newer models, high-end Audis, German cars, those types of things. You'll have to check it on the console inside the car. Others will have dipsticks. Uh, check all of your lights, your high beams, your low beams, your clearance lights, your parking lights. Check your brake lights. Make sure that your four-way flashers work. So make sure all the lights are working, as Mallory said earlier and then inspect your tires. Uh, all new tires will have wear bars on them. Make sure that the tread isn't down to the wear bars. Make sure that you don't have any uneven wear on the tires of your vehicle and make sure that you don't have any cracks or unusual abrasions on your tires or those types of things. Keep in mind with tires, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's the only thing between you and the bitumen. So make sure that you have good quality tires on your vehicle. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Good luck on your driver's test. We'll get back over here. Boston, Costco has the best value for batteries. Yes, they do. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, the thing with batteries is that you can buy a battery that will start your car and get you going up and down the road and those types of things. It's awesome. If you have bigger demands on your battery, you're towing a trailer, you have accessories that you're running power from the battery or those types of things, other accessories in the car, whatnot, uh, you're running a cooler or whatnot, you might need a bigger battery in your vehicle. So, you know, talk to a mechanic or someone else that might be able to help you out with sourcing out a battery for your vehicle, but most of the time you're just gonna be able to buy a regular battery and dump it into your vehicle uh, that they're gonna recommend. Okay, uh, lots of new cars. Spark plugs can be changed between 60,000 kilometers to 160,000 kilometers. Uh, Boston, yeah, that's probably okay, but I would really go with whatever's recommended for the uh, vehicle brand and make that you have. 160,000 kilometers for a set of spark plugs, that seems like a very long time uh, because I'm more inclined to change spark plugs at kind of the 15 to 30,000 mile mark, which is a lot less than that. So, uh, coils can be changed as well on newer cars, okay. Uh, all right. Yes, and lots of new cars do have sensors and they will tell you what's wrong with your vehicle and those types of things. Uh, so, but again, it's physically, sometimes you just have to physically go in and check things. So for example, power steering fluid, I did forget to mention that. Power steering fluid, radiator fluid, brake fluid. Uh, some vehicles, my vehicle for example, has a hydraulic clutch on it. You'll want to check the fluid on the hydraulic clutch. And I know for a fact that if the hydraulic fluid on the clutch gets down, the clutch will go soft on the buggy. So I have to keep that topped up. Now that's easy to keep topped up because 
the clutch fluid is the same as the brake fluid. So it's the dot three, dot four brake fluid. I can just put that into the hydraulic clutch. Now, depending on you know what kind of a person you are, you have to ask yourself that as a vehicle owner. What kind of person am I? Do I want to keep my vehicle in tip top shape and have everything done? have it all done at a dealership. That's kind of one end of the spectrum. And then we have the other end of the spectrum where we're just buying an old car and we're just gonna drive it into the ground. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of a driver am I? What kind of a vehicle am I? So when you're looking at maintenance for your vehicle, you know, what's the cost? How often do I have to do it? And those types of things. And then, you know, move forward from there. Big Mac Sam, how are you, my friend? <laughs> Tuning in from the Bronx, hello, hello. Uh, Tyler, going to get my high pressure hose fixed. It's leaking fluid all over the place. High pressure hose. So when you're talking high pressure hose, are you talking about the coolant, Tyler? Uh, Xander, hello, my friend. And Tim, the spark plugs on my Tacoma pickup are supposed to be replaced at 110,000 kilometers according to the maintenance schedule. <laughs> uh, Tim, do you find that works at 110,000 kilometers? Uh, now, because I just, I like putting new plugs in my buggy at probably somewhere between 20 and 40,000 kilometers. I'm probably, you know, because spark plugs are inexpensive and uh, it just makes it run better. Uh, Crystal, my dri driving practice went well this week. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, Carl, is it safe to put decorative caliper covers on a car? Uh, yes, it is. Absolutely. Uh, Carl, you can put decorative caliper. Uh, caliper color covers on your vehicle no doubt it's not going to affect the the performance of your brakes like you said it's just a cover it just clips in and it's a little cover that prevents brake dust and that sort of thing from coming out so yes you can put those on uh xander when will car prices go down uh xander the unfortunate thinking that i have is i don't think that car prices are in fact going to go down uh, i don't i i hate to say that uh, Tyler, high pressure power steering hose is leaking. The hose is cracked in the steel and is rusted. Oh, okay, so Tyler, you're going to get your power steering fixed. Awesome. Uh, Tim says that his mileage is still good. So yeah, okay, so maybe you can run 60,000 miles on a set of spark plugs before you have to have them replaced. Uh, Boston, the CRV is just about to turn over 370,000 kilometers. <laughs> and I'm going to get the timing belt replaced on it because I don't want it to break on me. <laughs> so... Uh, Raken, uh, how do I teach someone who's terrified of driving to drive? Uh, Raken, uh, you might not be able to do it, but if they are willing to try it and willing to move forward, the place that I would start with them is working in a parking lot with pylons, three meter tall or th three feet tall, one meter tall pylons. Work in a pi in a parking lot with them. Have a look at the second lesson with Gavin. Corey will put that video up for you and I show you the slow speed maneuvers that you can do in the parking lot. If you can get them comfortable working with slow speed maneuvers in the parking lot, you'll get some success. And with that success, you will move forward with the person and they will begin to get confidence. And once they start getting that confidence, that will overcome the fear and anxiety they have around driving. So start in a parking lot start working with the pylons and that will really uh, be a good place to get you going okay uh, Tyler ATS fuel injection cleaner is the best one out there okay awesome that's a great recommendation Buify coolant fluid is low can I top it up with water uh, Buify no you your best bet is to top it up with radiator fluid so go and <clears throat> It's inexpensive. It's only about twelve or fifteen dollars for a jug of radiator fluid. Get the stuff that's already mixed, okay? So it's already 50/50 water, or you can mix it yourself. But you need another jug, and you mix it half and half. But you can get the stuff that's already pre-mixed, and then just put that in. That's much better than putting straight water in, because if you get the ratio of radiator fluid to water incorrect, and you're in winter climate, uh, you potentially could cause the fluid inside the coolant system to freeze and if that happens as we know ice expands and you'll you know damage the cooling system of your vehicle so make sure you put radiator fluid in it and also if you go to a shop and it's not low very much you know they might charge you five or ten dollars to, to top up the radiator fluid all right uh tim going to manage the kitchen hopefully back before the end <laughs> enjoy tim 
Uh, and Corey's put up the video of Gavin there that'll give you the slow speed maneuvers. Uh, Mallory, this week my mom and I are following a motorcycle or traveling through town. Once they turn left, they continue to put on their left turn signal. Uh, yeah, and the reason for that, Mallory, it's just, <clears throat> it's not malicious. It's not intentional. Uh, blinkers on most motorcycles do not turn off automatically as they do in a car. You have to remember to turn them off. So that can be, sometimes it happens that you're a little bit forgetful when you're driving a motorcycle. Uh, Boston older cars need maintenance more often. Oil, spark plugs, filters, fluids to extend the life of the car. Uh, it's you know it it kind of depends on the model. Boston sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, you know as long as you keep the the engine oil changed, do the tune-ups and those types of things. Uh, I found that the the old Honda the last couple of years has needed a lot of attention, love and care, but it's it's still going. Uh, John. My 2010 Honda Freed is 155,000 uh, miles. Should I change the transmission fluid? Uh, if the transmission fluid hasn't been changed, then yes, I would probably take it in for a service, get the filter change, get the oil changed, and it's just going to really like you a lot more. And uh, if you're finding that the shifting is maybe a little bit rough or it's not as smooth as you might think it is, then yeah, you could definitely get a uh, transmission service, and that'll really help you out as well. Uh, Tyler, I go to German car specialist, very honest, doesn't upcharge, uh, very nice, has shop at his house, that's awesome. Yeah, it's always good if you have a German car, whether you have a Volkswagen or an Audi, Mercedes, and if you can find a technician that does German vehicles exclusively, then that's, that's your best bet in terms of keeping your vehicle well maintained and getting things fixed and whatnot, so yes. Uh, Joe, if someone is learning how to drive in the winter, they need to practice turning on the defrost before they hit the road. Uh, if the windows frost up after they get moving, they can get flustered. <laughs> that is very true, Joe. One of the, the things that I say, I repeat again and again for new drivers is at minimum, turn on the defrost, be able to turn on the windshield wipers, and be able to turn on the headlights and the high-low beams. At minimum, be able... <coughs> Excuse me. At minimum, be able to turn on those three secondary controls. So again, the defrost, wipers, intermittent, low and high, and then the high-low beams on the headlights as well. So be able to turn all of that on. Because as you said, Joe, you get out on the road and you're looking at the controls and you're trying to figure out how to turn on the defrost and then all of a sudden you're distracted driving because you can't figure out how to do that. <clears throat> and on most heater controls, there's two main knobs. The one knob on the left controls the level of the fan. The other one turns the temperature of the heat, whether it's max or whatnot. And then you have buttons to direct where the heat blows. And you want to figure out which one of those buttons you have to push to get the air to blow onto the front windshield. And then you want it on maximum heat and you want it on a maximum fan for the best defrost. Now, the other couple of other things you can do if the air conditioning doesn't come on automatically when you turn on the defrost, turn the air conditioning on if you can. Some models will let you, some will not. Uh, my old buggy, if you turn on the defrost on full, the air conditioning will come on automatically. And the reason for that is because the air conditioning pulls the moisture out of the air in the cabin, which helps to defrost the glass and whatnot. Uh, the other thing you can do is roll down one of your windows just a crack to try and get some circulation and then... Uh, even out or moderate that temperature difference between outside and inside the cabin because that's what creates frost or what that's what creates uh, humidity and fog in on the glass inside the car so you want to try and even out that temperature difference between outside and inside now I know that you're in a little bit chilly but you'll defrost the windows and keep yourself safe instead of being distracted so Corey's put up the video on how to work the secondary controls in your vehicles thank you for that so, uh, Supernatural, how are you, my friend? Uh, Carl, thanks again for all the amazing information you keep supplying us with. You are most welcome. And so we're talking about car maintenance tonight, keeping your car running smoothly so it doesn't end up on the side of the road as we did a couple of weeks ago in the buggy. I was telling you about that in the introduction. Uh, coming down the road, it just turned off like somebody turned the key off. And uh, my son and I ended up sitting on the road for 20 minutes and then it started up again and away we went. We ended up 
stalling again halfway up the highway and trust me the highway that we drive on between here and Kelowna there's no place to pull off on the side of the road so we got over as, as far as we could activated the hazard lights to warn traffic and then waited 15 minutes and again it fired up again and got it home and took it into the shop and of course they couldn't find anything they're looking at the forums on the Honda uh, you know the blogs and those types of things trying to figure out what it was they thought it was the igniter <clears throat> and the igniter is essentially where the electricity comes in and then it sends it to the uh, distributor and the distributor parcels it out to the spark plugs changed that changed a few other things and uh, you know took it in in the morning at eight o'clock called them at noon nothing and figured it it was they replaced a bunch of parts <laughs> and changing more parts on the buggy and uh, so finally in the afternoon I needed it because I had to take my son to sports and I thought, well, it'll run enough to get him down there. And if it stalls, well, I'll just pull off the road and wait. And uh, went down in the afternoon to pick it up and they said, oh, we figured out what it was. <laughs> and they said it was an old remote engine starter on the vehicle. And I didn't even know there was a remote engine starter on the old buggy because all I ever had was a key for it. And they said, oh, yeah, that's what we figured out what it was. And uh, the shop that I take it to was really good. I mean, they changed a number of parts on it. And it wasn't anything, you know, the, the, they only charged me $100 in labor. And they had it there most of the day, which was very kind on their end. And uh, so I figured out what one of them had, what one of their beverages of choice was and took it down a, a bottle of rum to say thanks for all the work they did on the buggy. And, you know, the buggy lives <laughs> yet again. And, uh, you know, as I said, I didn't even know I had a remote engine starter on my vehicle, but I was talking to Doug, the mechanic, and uh, he said, yeah, he was working up in the oil fields and these guys with these brand new pickup trucks, you know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 pickup trucks, and they would just shut down in the oil field and they would get them towed into town 200 kilometers away, 160 miles away. And uh, they would find out that it was the remote engine starter. So he was just had some experience with that sort of thing. And that's ended up what it was. He unplugged it. It's run fine ever since. So kind of crazy. Uh, Joe, I trained my son to operate all the primary controls and the most important secondary controls without looking down. It took some practice, but it's essential in my opinion. Uh, you're absolutely right, Joe. And that's excellent that you were able to do that and teach him how to turn on uh, defrost, how to work the radio and the wipers and the high-low beams and all those sorts of things. And it really should be kind of second nature when you're driving. Uh, Buify, why is my upper radiator hose is flat, please? Uh, Buify, your upper radiator hose is probably flat because it something happened that created a vacuum in the system. Or you might have an air pocket in the system. Now, that might be something that will have to be replaced and it can never be kind of unflattened. Uh, generally, what happens, when, you know, if there's any work that's been done on the cooling system, whether they changed out the thermostat or one of the hoses was taken off or those types of things, uh, the way that you, you put the system back together and then you start the engine and then you pour radiator flue into the radiator, so that it's circulating through the engine block and through the channels in the engine, through the hoses and those types of things so that it's pumping that fluid. You fill the radiator all the way to the top and then you put the cap back on, you pressurize the system and it's continuing to pump through and then you fill the rest of the reservoir into the overflow reservoir for the radiator because you've got the radiator and because it's pressurized and you heat it up when you shut the car off it continues to heat up more and the, the liquid expands inside the cooling system and then it goes into the overflow tank and there's a plastic tank there that has a minimum and a maximum and you want the fluid between the minimum and the maximum on your radiator so what's happened is you may have there's been a vacuum somewhere that's flattened one of your hoses now the mechanic may be able to take that apart put it back on without replacing the hose and then refill this this the cooling system and that can be rectified or you may have to have the hose completely replaced uh, to be to get that unflattened but I would suggest that you do that before summer comes so that you have proper circulation of the cooling system uh, of the fluid inside the cooling system and that it works properly and your engines are not going to overheat because the other piece of maintaining and keeping your vehicle good are 
not blowing up the engine because if you overheat it and you run it hot for too long, uh, you'll melt the the rings inside the pistons inside the engine and essentially you've fried the engine and it's, you're, you're not going to fix it, okay? Uh, <laughs> Carl says, I should chip you a bottle of rump. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Uh, boss, I took my road test today in Colorado when I passed. I never thought I would. I just wanted to thank you for such great videos. It means the world's great live stream. Have a great night. And you as well, boss, congratulations on passing your driver's test. That is awesome news there in Colorado. All the best, my friend. And what did you do to celebrate your victory of passing your driver's license? That is awesome. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Crystal, I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. And Sam, thank you very much for hitting, uh, asking people to hit the like and thumbs up button here. That's great. Uh, Tyler, my car runs good. Just the small issue with the power steering hose. Yeah, and if you can get that fixed, then it's just not leaking anymore. Uh, Epic, my friend. In some places, you are also su subjected to yearly inspections. And that is true. Uh, so you got to take your vehicle in and get it inspected annually. Uh, New York State. All registered vehicles, uh, New Jersey is commercial vehicles, regular two years after, try to repair parts for inspection to avoid getting rejected, things that will have to be uh, fixed and whatnot. And you're absolutely right, Epic. <clears throat> All commercial vehicles are inspected annually. School buses are every six months that they go in for an inspection. So know that, uh, that if you have a commercial vehicle, you're gonna have to get it inspected. Some places as well, if you sell your car, it's going to have to pass an inspection to be able to be sold to another buyer. Uh, that's another time that it has to be inspected, so know that. And some of this stuff you can do yourself. Uh, you know, if the oil needs to be changed or there's a headlight out or a brake light. Uh, brake lights are usually on most vehicles pretty easy to change out. Uh, if you can wield a screwdriver and, you know, pull out some screws, uh, you can change the brake lights and those types of things on the buggy. I mean, it's three screws and literally will take you 10 minutes to change. Headlights are the same. Now, <laughs> some makes and models, make sure that you you know look here on YouTube to see how to change headlights and those types of things. Uh, I was thinking that all vehicles were very easy to change headlights because on the buggy, for example, you just turn, give it a half turn out of the back of the housing, pull the bulb out, pull it out of the thing, stick the bulb back in uh, into the connection, put it back in, give it a half turn, and you're done changing the headlight. I was watching another video on the Malibu, the Chevy Malibu, and basically you have to take away, take, not take away, take apart half of the front end. It took a technician 35 minutes to take everything apart on the front end to be able to change the headlights. So it's not the same on every vehicle, and it's not that easy on some vehicles, so know that. Uh, Tyler, my air filter was another line to the air pump. Uh, okay. So line, uh, so it's not really a line, Tyler. It's more of a hose connection is, you know, for the air filter because it's a big hose. It's not a small hose like your uh, hydraulic lines to your power steering. Uh, Joe, according to the folks who make Molly Slip, it greatly reduces wear and tear between moving metal parts in the engine, but maybe modern synthetic oils are just as good for doing this. Uh, yeah, Joe, I think that there's a lot less friction with modern synthetic oils uh, that it's really going to be good and then of course there's STP which my mom likes to say is you know stay together please for older engines and whatnot uh, Chrissy I passed my driving test to uh, two weeks ago here in Queens uh, today I drove by myself for the first time and it was so liberating liberating thanks for your videos Chrissy that's awesome thank you for stopping back and letting us know that you passed your driver's test there in the Queens and or in Queens and uh, where did you go for a celebration, my friend, there in Queens? That is awesome that you're out driving around by yourself. Buify, it's my birthday today, Rick. I turned 40 today. Buify, happy birthday to you. <laughs> that is awesome that you turned 40. Are you feeling old now that you turned 40? Congratulations and happy birthday to you. Awesome, awesome. Mallory, I'm learning a lot of things about cars tonight that I didn't know about before. Yes, cars can be complicated and <clears throat> even those, uh, those of us that know a little bit about cars are still <laughs> trying to figure them out for sure. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more sensors and alarms and bells and things going off in cars these days 
uh, you know, so now we have uh, tire pressure sensors on all the tires and those types of things. So you, your tires aren't going to run low and whatnot, backup cameras and whatnot. Uh, boss, hey Rick, thank you so much for the congratulations. I really appreciate it. From some con uh, confusion, I made an appointment on the wrong day for the DMV. So Wednesday, but I plan to explore the roads. Awesome. That is great, my friend. Uh, boss, and many schedules will tell you every 10 to 15,000 kilometers, but that's too long for oil and filtering will prematurely wear your engine. And, and boss, and I tend to agree with you. I mean, unless you're running full synthetic oil, even with full synthetic oil, my preference would be kind of the eight to 10,000 kilometers. Uh, my Tracy's Audi has full synthetic oil in it. I think the recommendation of the oil changes is every 8,000 kilometers. I'd be more apt to go 8,000 kilometers. So <laughs> let's read the book. Uh, Tim said your owner's manual. Very few people read the owner's manual, but you know, if something goes wrong, it's a very good place to start is your owner's manual. There's all kinds of information in there that you couldn't even possibly begin to imagine. I mean, my owner's manual, one of the things that it tells you is how to adjust the valves on the buggy. And that's something that needs to be done kind of every three or four years. But the valves are something different because if you have an older vehicle and the valves need to be adjusted, you're going to hear it. Because it's when it when you start it up and it's cold, it's going to go tick, 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 tick. You can hear the, the valves kind of clanking away metal on metal. So know that uh, if you have one of those older vehicles and it needs a valve adjustment. I'm going to get the valve adjustment at the same time done that I'm going to get the timing belt done. So I'll get all of that done at the same time. Uh, the word uh, took me four tries to pass my driver's test, but so worth it. And congratulations on your tenacity and passing your driver's test after the fourth time. That is absolutely awesome, my friend. Congratulations. Uh, Epic, uh, if you are looking for a repair shop, try to ensure that they are ASE qualified or good service quality. My family uses a good car repair shop for non-body jobs for chassis repair uh, qualified shops. Okay. So that's, yes, and that's one of the things you want to make sure that they have the right certifications and licenses as a shop. You also want to ask friends and family who they recommend as a technician to do work on your car because unfortunately there are some bad stories out there of mechanics that, you know, are not reputable at all and will take your money and, you know, embezzle money from you and those types of things because that's essentially what they're doing but there are good shops out there i have a good shop as i said to you they had the car for two-thirds of a day last week they only charged me a hundred dollars in labor another time i took the vehicle and it was making a sound in the front end and uh, there was a stone stuck in behind the uh sh the disc brake shield <laughs> they said no you don't owe us any money it's it's all good so they figured it out what it was and were able to fix the vehicle so that's what happens uh mallory what is the timing belt in a car Okay, so the timing belt, <laughs> uh, petrol engines are four, they're called four stroke engines. So there's basically an intake, the piston sucks in the fuel and air, and then there's a, uh, there's a compression stroke, the piston comes back up, you create pressure in the system and it, the fuel ignites and explodes. You have the power stroke, which pushes the piston back down, and then you have an exhaust stroke. So it's a four-stroke engine. And there are four to eight pistons in a car. So we'll stick with a four-cylinder just to keep it simple. So there's four pistons in a car. And they, they fire one, three, two, four. <laughs> so the first one fires, the third one fires, the spark plug fires, two fires, and then four fires. So they fire at different uh, different intervals so that you get a power stroke all the time from a, from an engine. And this is what the timing belt does, runs the valves so that they open and close at the same time that you're putting fuel and air into the, into the engine. Now that's probably a lot con a, a confusing, but that's essentially what the timing belt does is runs the intake valve and the out and the exhaust valve so that they're opening and closing at the right time. Petrol engines, Four stroke petrol engines are, there's a lot of stuff that has to be coordinated to the exact millisecond and computers have actually allowed vehicles to be much more precise, pro, pro, uh, produce more horsepower and be more fuel efficient. And this is the, what the timing belt does is from the crankshaft, the main crankshaft 
opens and closes the valves on the uh, on the engine. Does that make a little bit of sense, or was that really complicated? <laughs> uh, Tim says driving uh, the timing belt drives the camshaft from the drive shaft, which is exactly correct. Uh, Tim says our CRV says oil changes every year or when the dash tells you to, whichever is first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim, I wouldn't, I don't think I would rely on that. Uh, what year is your CRV, Tim? Uh, Goose, I know next to nothing about cars. I just know how to drive them and teach others how to drive them. <laughs> uh, I kind of grew up in a garage, so uh, that's why I know a little bit about cars. Uh, Boston, my newer cars have direct injection, which all needed, which also needed a service. Carbon cleaning, if not done, uh, can cause issues with rough idle and poor fuel uh, economy, and that is true. And Boston, sometimes you just, as you said, you put that fuel injector cleaner in there that will help out and whatnot. Uh, Tyler, I changed my oil when it looks darker on the paper towel. Uh, I generally am more precise about that. I changed the oil on the CRV every 3,000 miles, every 5,000 kilometers. I'm pretty religious about that. I'm usually within a couple hundred miles of that interval. So it's pretty easy for me because I just change it at five and 10,000. And as we said, uh, engine oil is inexpensive. I mean, it, it cost me less than $30 to change the oil in the buggy. Uh, Sam, I'm glad you are answering these questions, Rick. That's a mouthful of an answer for the timing belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I could make that a little bit less complicated. Uh, so essentially, let's just stick with one piston. Let's try that one more time because I think that some people might be confused by that. Okay, so it's a four-stroke engine. So what happens is uh, intake, the piston goes to the bottom of the chamber. It sucks in the fuel in the air. The piston goes back up. It's called a compression stroke because it creates pressure inside the cylinder in the cylinder in the piston wall goes back down, the, the spark plug ignites the fuel and air mixture inside the piston, it forces the piston down, and then the piston comes back up and you get an exhaust stroke. So what happens is, is at the beginning, when you get the intake, the uh, intake valve opens up to let air in and the fuel mixture. And then it goes up and it goes back down, it comes back up and the exhaust valve opens up to release burnt gases out of the piston chamber. So essentially what the timing belt is doing on each one of the four cylinders is opening and closing the intake and exhaust valves on the engine for that timing of bringing air and fuel into the uh, cylinder chamber and then it's opening the exhaust valves to get rid of any gases that were a result of the combustion inside of the chamber. That's probably a little bit, that's simpler and a little bit easier to understand is what the timing belt is doing. <laughs> Uh, Tim, I usually have about 30% left on the oil life at the one year mark. Uh, you probably don't, you, you don't drive your CRV very much if you still have 30% left every year. That's great. Uh, Mallory, I've become a much smarter passenger thanks to your videos and all of the great information that you provide for us. And thank you for that compliment, Mallory. That is awesome. Tyler, Toyota has a dual system fuel injection system, port injection on the intake and direct injection on the cylinders, so you need, uh, so no need to carbon clean. Okay, yes, and most engines, I was trying to do the timing belt and the intake and exhaust valves at a very simplistic level. Uh, most, <laughs> most new engines are dual overhead cams, just to make it even more complicated and uh, you know more stuff going on uh, with the engines. Uh, Joe, my engine overheated in the dead of winter in rural Quebec after I spun out and hit a snowbank. It was freezing out, but the engine was overheating all good when I cleared the snow off the radiator. Yes, and that's uh, that's a good point that Joe just made. Uh, if you do get blockage uh, in the radiator, then that could cause your vehicle to overflow or overheat or the engine to overheat. And if your engine is overheating, if that coolant gauge inside your uh, vehicle goes into the red okay shut your engine off and figure out what's going on with your vehicle because you will do irreparable damage to the engine okay do not drive your car if the engine is overheated you will blow it up it's a very bad because then you got to replace the engine you can't fix that okay once you overheat it once you kill the engine because you've overheated it uh, 
you can't fix that. So I, you have to figure out what's going on. As Joe said, uh, snow got stuck in the radiator and caused it to overheat. The other thing is you have two engine. Uh, most radiators, most modern uh, radiators will have two fans on them. One is for the air conditioning and the other one is for the cooling system of the engine. Uh, make sure that those are turning and those are kicking in. The other way that you can check those as part of your pre-trip inspection is to turn your air conditioning on full and the electric fans, both of those should come on when your air conditioning is on maximum uh, in your vehicle. And again, that will help you out uh, in terms of not overheating your vehicle. Now, the other thing you can do in the summertime, if your vehicle, here's a little trick for you. If your engine is overheating or you're having trouble keeping the engine temperature at the right, out of the red on that gauge, you can turn the heat on inside the car and that will pull some of the heat out of the engine into the cabin. Now it's not very, it's not very fun in the middle of summer to have your heat on full, <laughs> but it will bring the temperature of your, uh, your engine temperature down and suck off some of the heat from the engine to keep it running at a temperature that maybe you could lip it into a shop or those types of things. Uh, Goose, I'd like to hear a bit more about your podcast. Have you started it yet? And where will I be able to listen to it? Okay, thanks, Goose. Uh, yes, the podcast is coming out at the beginning of June. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm repurposing this live stream. So I'm taking the hour, I'm cutting it down to a half an hour, and we're going to be sending it out there to the world. Uh, it's going to. It's called the Smarter Driver Podcast. It's basically to help people out that you know want to just listen to the podcast when they don't have time. They don't have to show up here at six o'clock. They can just download the podcast and listen to it. So it's essentially. The presentation that I'm doing and great comments, you know, the stuff we're talking about here in terms of changing your engine oil, maintenance on your vehicle, uh, you know, how to cool your vehicle down in the summertime and those types of things. So that's what the podcast is going to be. And we'll talk about more about that when we get closer to June. Thank you for that. Uh, boss, you're most welcome. Thank you so much for the great live stream. I love hearing about the maintenance and I don't personally think that timing belt explanation was too complicated. <laughs> Thank you, boss. I appreciate that because I was trying to make it as simple as possible because it can get very complicated. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to my mechanic there a couple of weeks ago when the, when the engine starter overrode the engine. Uh, 15,000 separate parts. Most cars are made up of approximately 15,000 parts. So it's some days I think to myself, it's kind of a miracle that these things even run, but there you go. Uh, Mallory, I understood what you were talking about when it came come to the timing belt. Awesome. Mallory, I've been a much, okay, we read that one, awesome. Uh, Boston water pump and thermostat would be changed as well. Uh, yes, uh, and Boston, the timing belt on the Honda CRVs, they usually do the water pump at the same time. One other point that I, now I'm thinking about the water pump, the fuel pump, here's a good maintenance tip. Don't run your vehicle below a quarter of a tank of fuel consistently, if you do that, what happens is, is the, the fuel sloshes around in the tank. The fuel pump sits at the bottom of your fuel tank. It comes out of the fuel because the fuel in your tank actually cools and lubricates the fuel pump. So if you consistently run your tank less than a quarter of a tank, eventually what's going to happen is, is that the fuel pump is exposed, it runs hot, and eventually you're going to burn out the fuel pump in your vehicle. So if you can keep it above a quarter of a tank, that's going to prolong the life of your fuel pump in your vehicle. So there's a little little tip for you. Uh, Sparzo, I just uh, got my car realigned yesterday, but sometimes when I break the wheel pulls to the side, left and right, is this normal or do I need to go back and have it uh, looked at again? Uh, Sparzo, if it's pulling to one side or the other, that might be your brakes. That might not be the wheel alignment. Uh, so I would take it back and get them to just look at your brakes and see whether that's something that they might be able to rectify for you. It could be an alignment issue, but it's more likely it's a brake issue than it than that is. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you as well, Joe. You have a fabulous week. Uh, Alexander, I'm a new car owner. Noticed water dripping under the car just below the front passenger seat. Is this normal? Uh, Alexander, yes, if you have an air conditioning and you are running the air conditioning in your vehicle, when you stop and park the vehicle, then yes, the air conditioning will drip. It's the condensation on your uh, air conditioning pump that's dripping under the vehicle. So yes, that could be normal for you. So have a look at that and just see if it's that. If uh, Keep an eye on your radiator fluid level. 
If you notice that it's not going down, then it's definitely your air conditioning uh, pump for sure. Okay. Uh, Passat, that's a Volkswagen vehicle, Camdy, is it not? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you're going to uh, do well. Uh, Mallory, do all cars have timing belts? Not all cars. Some vehicles, actually a lot of vehicles, actually have chains. And chains are don't require as much maintenance as timing belts do. All right. So we're going to leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for all your questions. Great conversation about maintaining our vehicles. Lots of information there. Uh, if you have any questions at all, leave a comment down in the comment section. Hit that thumbs up button. If you're going for a license, be sure to check out the Smarter Driver course package over at the Smart Drive Test website. And if you had a license test in the last couple of weeks that you passed, congratulations. You have a test coming up this week. Good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answers. Not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.